This, you know, is the biggest headache as we get out of our, you know, into the recovery phase out of the pandemic. Is actually many people have lost their jobs, and it's unclear what the jobs of tomorrow will be. Is this actually probably the the, the most common policy would mistake would be leaders not retraining their workforce to make sure that they can have the jobs of tomorrow? I think this is one of those areas of challenge where there is remarkable consistency regardless of who we speak to as to the nature of the problem. So we just launched today our chief economist outlook. And the area that they are most concerned about is long-term economic scarring due to bankruptcies as support measures are pulled back. And second, long-term scarring in the labor market. All of that leading towards that K-shaped recovery. You get a very similar picture when you speak to, for example, chief human resources officers or labor economists, exactly the same worry. So the good news is we know what the problem is, but it is going to take more than reskilling. Reskilling and retraining is going to have to be a big part of the solution. But the second thing that we're going to need is a medium term focus on actually investing in the jobs of tomorrow. I think a completely passive approach on the part of policymakers is unlikely to work. What are what do you see, Sadia, as the jobs of tomorrow? So we've uh, been mapping out across seven big sectors what the jobs of tomorrow are likely to be. One big area is care jobs. You know, a big win-win for society. These are jobs that are needed because of demographic challenges and changes, but these also happen to be big areas of mass job creation. What we need is higher wages, better certifications. A second big area is the education sector. So reskilling itself is likely to provide a massive job creation opportunity. A third is, no surprise at all, the digital economy. And within that, you've got sort of a whole set of areas around cloud computing and AI and machine learning specialists and data analysts, just a massive area of growth. And then there's a number of others that relate to a new kind of customer service, new kinds of um, marketing, uh, new kinds of HR-related roles. All of these are big job creators. And then, of course, not surprisingly, the green economy and all of the jobs associated with that. What governments will need is to ensure that as their stimulus packages try to build these markets of tomorrow, there is an equal effort on building the jobs of tomorrow. And that requires a slightly more directional, slightly more prescriptive approach than we currently have to reskilling and upskilling markets. For those that are already inside companies, this is going to be fairly easy to do. But for those that will be wholly displaced and that will be looking for new opportunities, there's going to need to be more guidance provided by governments. Um, Sadia, is there a government or a region that actually gets it more than others that are doing this right and are looking at the transition the correct way? No, Francine, you're not going to be surprised when I give you the Nordics um, as the example, right? So these are governments that have for quite a long time put human capital and sort of the, the software of the economy at the heart and at the center of what needs to change if their economies are going to be ready. They are, again, doing a fairly good job of using the sort of basic flex security system that exists to, on the one hand, have a relative level of flexibility on the labor market and to combine that with security for workers and to try to preserve work and workers and their income rather than to simply preserve specific jobs. They're again doing a fairly good job of managing the shift that's currently underway. But across the developed and the developing world, this is going to have to be a set of practices that are embraced by everybody. Um, Sadia, I mean, I, I know a, a lot of the forum will also be not, you know, not only on the scarring and, and kind of these new jobs that are being created, but I guess the, the work from home or the flexibility in work and approaches. And do you think that's something that will change the way we live and work because of the pandemic? Or is there a chance that actually even our economies go back to the way it was pre-pandemic? There's an interesting bifurcation going on at the moment in a lot of the white collar workforce that has been able to work from home over the course of the last year, the big debate is really about what level of return to the office is going to happen. Is it going to be full return to the office? Is it going to be fully stay working from home in a very flexible way? Or will it be a hybrid? The large majority of companies, particularly in Europe, are ending up in that hybrid space with at least two to three days of minimum in office presence. The other part of the workforce is really those that have not been able to do much of their work without in-person interaction, 
who over the last year have been sort of bearing the brunt of the front end of this uh, health crisis or have had to be um, essentially out of work. Now, that's where you're seeing some of the most interesting developments. New jobs are being created, but workers are not necessarily ready to rush straight back into work. In part, that's because of the support they're currently re um, uh, receiving. In part, it's because vaccination programs are not complete. But in part, it's also because many workers are asking themselves, is this worth it? And they might be looking for more of an opportunity to either reskill away from that in-person workforce or to see if um, their employers are going to offer them higher wages. And that's where you're going to see that upward wage pressure in some of those that frontline work. Sonia, I know you've done also a lot of work on economic development. Are, are we looking at a more balanced, balanced and equitable future for countries and also populations within countries? Or, again, is it going to be the same old mess? You know, much of what we've been talking about so far is about that within-country K-shaped recovery. It's about the rising inequality. For the first time in about 20 years, you're seeing that the middle class is shrinking and you're seeing that poverty levels are rising. But this is also playing out at an international level. There is, again, for the first time, the risk of a major divergence between developed and developing economies rather than the kind of convergence that we've been aspiring to. In part, this is pre-pandemic trends. It's because that old model that was on the basis of competing um, with cheap labor or aspiring to a sort of manufacturing-based uh, development model, that's been going out the window for some time, and the pandemic has just made it worse. And so those economies will have to think very differently about some fundamental investments in education, on digitization, on human capital uh, build out within their economies and using a very different growth model in the future. But some part of this is really because of the pandemic. These countries don't have the fiscal room to have provided the same kind of support to their workers, to companies, and to have had the same kind of healthcare response. And that is where measures that will provide vaccinations to uh, developing economies and measures that will provide a lot more support so that they can shore up their economies will be critical. That is the only way to avoid the risk, not just of inequality within countries, but also across countries.